Hey, everybody. Happy Friday. What's going on out there? Facebook and YouTube, LinkedIn. We're broadcasting live uh, on many different platforms today to give out some, some incredible information. Um, and uh, what's provoked this, uh, this, uh, this live is the fact that there's a lot of misinformation out there. So what I did is uh, I've, I've uh, reached out to a professional uh, that I trust and that has been hearing lots of things about the industry and a lot of misnomers about what's actually happening out there um, with forbearance and what are you doing with your payments? Um, are the banks going to be tying up the money coming out of this downturn? W what does the downturn look like? And so we're going to cover a few of those things. And I, I will promise you this, that there is somebody in your life, I will guarantee that has not said anything to you is being affected by this as far as their mortgage goes. So they may not be saying it to you, but there are things going on. So if you hear people say, I lost my job, I got laid off or whatever, we're going to keep this positive today, but we're going to also give accurate information. Um, and for disclosure, this is just our personal opinions. Um, but you're talking to two people that study the market and are looking to give information out to help um, uh, protect and uh, help educate uh, all of our friends and family out there and clients, right? So I want to introduce uh, Jordan Gerard. I appreciate you coming out, Jordan. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Oh, you're welcome, Kurt. I've been in the mortgage business for 17 years. Um, I started in Lafayette, um, that's where I'm from, and uh, worked my way up, regional manager, national sales manager. I was a CEO of a large mortgage company. And I stepped down recently to open up North Shore Mortgage Partners. I live in Mandeville now. I'm the managing partner of a mortgage company here. Um, you know, we do quite a bit of business. We're doing a ton of refis right now. So I've seen every side of it from a loan officer from the subprime days to now. My experience ranges from behind the curtain to the front of the curtain, not just a loan officer. I've seen the mortgage company side of things from trying to figure out what to do whenever your clients are in these situations. And I also see the client perspective. So I know a little bit about all pieces of the mortgage industry, not just selling mortgages, but also trying to service them, what the mortgage companies are going through right now on trying to make a profit like every other business when people are in forbearance, you know? So I understand the stress it's putting on the client plus the stress it's putting on mortgage industry as a whole and the businesses. So I'm gonna try to help everybody understand what's happening to the industry as a whole, not just what's happening to consumers. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, um, <clears throat> You know, I, I went to uh, my bank this morning and I just kind of looked. And let me tell you something. You had to dig really, really deep to try to find out what it was in order to uh, defer or go into four parents. Everything about the COVID-19 on there was more about the PPP and the EIDL and, and, and how they can get you more money and whatever. Well, that's because they get well. That's because they get paid. I don't know if people know this, but the banks that process the PPP loans are getting five points on that amount. So if you get a hundred thousand dollar PPP loan from Whitney Bank, Whitney Bank is going to get five thousand dollars for brokering that loan. So there is profit in the bank to do PPP loans. So of course they're going to market that. There's no profit in forbearance, and they're going to lose money. So of course they're and look. Let me tell you. Try to get information by calling the service line, the one eight hundred number on your mortgage statement. Try to get it that way. See how long you're on hold. <laughs> Some of my buddies told me three and four hours. It's just it's a really painstaking process to get proper information. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and it's a shame. But uh, you know these are the first uh, uh, companies that got their hand raised uh, looking for a bailout. And uh, and again, I don't want to get political, but you know I, I think that. Um, you know, I, I, um, I went after the PPP, uh, you know, and, and I went through my local bank and so, uh, I felt comfortable doing that, but the rules are the same everywhere. Um, but when it gets to this forbearance, uh, thing for banks, whether it be large or small, I wanted to see if you could address the, um, the handling of a forbearance or let's put it this way. What does forbearance really mean? Okay. In terms in, 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 in length of term or what are the terms or what could be the terms? Let's, let's handle that real quick. Yeah, I'll be real clear with you. The way each servicing bank who holds your mortgage right now handles it is going to be different. But the term forbearance in general means that nothing changes about the money you owe. It just changes when you owe it. So how they handle that 
is going to be really, really different. What I mean by that is a mortgage is a recorded instrument at the courthouse. You can't just change the terms of that without doing what's called a loan modification. So your notes the same, your payments the same, your due dates are all the same. A forbearance is just an adjustment of your payment temporarily to get you through a tough time. For example, what we're seeing mostly is three months of forbearance. Let's just say for argument's sake, your mortgage payment is $1,000. You call the bank and they say, yes, Mr. Customer, you don't have to pay for three months. That's $3,000 you save. However, on month four, when you make that $1,000 payment, please pay us the other three as well. So the $4,000 is now going to be due in 120 days. All they really did was move your due date down and turn it into a lump sum 120 days down the road. So all you're doing is really kicking the can, which I can't tell you for your family and your job situation, that is not the right answer. But to think it's free money, to think they're going to tack it on to your balance in 30 years and in 90 days you're going to pick up with regular payments, that's wrong. The bank can't do that. They can't change the terms of your loan. They can hold off on payments, you know, not report it or whatever they want to do for you, but they can't change the terms of your loan and just say, okay, pay the last three, you know, let's add three months to the end. No, because your mortgage due date is a certain day. I can't give you three months to the end. I have to collect from you at a certain point. And that point is usually when the forbearance is up. So it's only kicking the can down the road. It's not giving you free money. It's not saving you money long term. So there's usually better options if you're not in a tough spot. I had buddies call me thinking, oh, wait, I'm going to get out some mortgage payments and they haven't even lost their job. I'm like, no, you're not. You're going to owe yourself four times as much in three months. Don't do it unless you need to do it. I cannot tell you how to run your finances or your family, but it's not something that should be done as a benefit. It should be done as a last resort. Yeah. I, and look, I, I, I had to really dig deep to find out, you know, what that was about. And then somebody called me and said, hey, look, man, I, I found out that, you know, I've got, say, my payment's $1,000 a month. I'm going to owe $4,000 in 90 days. So in the 120th uh, day from the time you uh, get the uh, the help, you're going to be owed for, you know, just be $4,000. Now, if you lost your job and you are affected by this, this is saying that, okay, well, I'll tell you what, you'll get a job in three to four months and go ahead and pay us $4,000 on your first check. It's just not, it's just not feasible, you know? Yeah, for certain situations, it's not. And, and you know what? It's going to report to your credit regardless. So this is the one thing we're seeing that even if um, it doesn't affect your credit score because they only report it as a forbearance, if you want to buy a house in the next two years, Let's say it doesn't hurt your credit at all. Like you have a 750 now, you go in the forbearance, you make your $4,000 payment in four months because you're able to. If you can't, it's going to be a late payment then. But let's say you are, are able to kick a can down the road three months, four months, you pay the $4,000. You still, mortgage companies are putting out guidance now. You still will not be able to buy or refinance for two years if you have a forbearance. Once you file for forbearance, I hope to God you're not looking to buy or sell next year, not looking to refinance because they will not grant you an approval. You're all, they're going to treat it almost like a foreclosure or a bankruptcy. Once you file forbearance, you're a complete no-go for at least a year at most banks and some banks too. So even if your score doesn't drop, your eligibility for financing now has dropped because you filed for forbearance. That's something to, to really think about. Your score may be the same. We don't really know how they're going to treat that yet because we don't have a track record. I personally would, wouldn't risk it on my score. But even if your score says the same, you're going to have a scarlet letter of an F for forbearance and mortgage companies 100% will now let you not let you. Per Let's say you get your job back in five months. You file a forbearance and you want to get a bigger house. You want to sell your house. Can't do it. Wow. You're completely no go for 12 months, maybe 24 months. We're still feeling it out. But all of our investors have put overlays. If you're in forbearance, have a forbearance, no refis, no purchases, 12 months, you're no go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I, I thought about this question earlier because, you know, OK, so your score there, but now there's going to be an extra overlay to find out if you actually took um, uh, the extra payments off or whatever. And I think that uh, there are a lot of people right now who just don't know what that means. And if, you know, lives are changing and, and obviously our, a lot of our lives have changed over the last uh, six to eight weeks. but 
a lot of lives are changing and you don't know where you'll be in two years. I've sold houses to people in a year and a half later, they're looking to move. So if you really don't need to take this forbearance or actually, you know, if you lost your job, understand you got to do what you got to do. I get it. But I, you know, I believe honestly that there are going to be some serious ramifications the way this is structured. It has to, it has to be last resort, plain and simple because we're about to enter into the best buying market we've had in a long time, you know, because people are going to need to sell their houses. We are already in the best refinance market. Are you willing as a consumer, are you willing as a homeowner to pass up all the benefits you can have of buying right now, of refinancing right now, just to miss three months of payments? Are you willing to pass all of that up for three months of payments that are going to be due in 120 days? Yeah, it doesn't seem like a win to me. It better be last resort or there's no way it makes any sense. It just doesn't make sense unless it's the only way you can get through this. Yeah, no doubt. And I can tell you right now, and it, that brings up this other question, like what's next? You know, what can we expect from the housing market? And again, it's all hypotheticals. It's all theory. It's all, you know, personal opinion. But all I can really do uh, in time is just look at history and benchmarks and what's happened. Uh, uh, through our MLS and through our um, uh, collaboration through other people across the, the nation, not just Louisiana or not just Arkansas or not just Texas, right? So right. I think, I think the, the, uh, the, the one thing that I'm, I'm saying is right now, people are calling me. Uh, I'm busier right now than I have been in uh, previous COVID-19, six months prior. Uh, the end of oh, last year. Yeah, yeah. The, the end of last year was slower. You know, and I think a lot of things uh, are uh, actually, um, uh, or the reason for that is is obviously low interest rates and, you know, it's provoking a lot of this. And then in January, man, we were just like screaming busy and going into that second weekend of January. Then when school stopped, okay, when they pretty much just said school is over with, that became our summer. So basically, you know how we get busy in that March and April because people start looking and in May, June, they want to go because school is out. We're in our summertime. We're in our busy time. So I want to say this to all the people uh, that'll be sending this out to other people and whatever. If you're looking to sell your house, you need to think about doing that right now. Don't be scared to list your house right now. There are buyers who put one under contract yesterday. I've got I, another. I sold the house yesterday too, Kirk. <laughs> so, so, you know, things are happening. But if you mentally, and we talk about mindset, but if you mentally think that you're in, uh, in a, a black hole and you're alone, you're not. You have to mentally think this through. This is why we're doing things like this. This is going to help a lot of people. I've been on a lot of uh, webinars just like this and a lot of lives. And, and so I could prepare to give uh, the people that are connected to me and of course, Jordan, uh, the information, the right information. Because you, you look, I have heard the word forbearance on the news for six weeks, okay? I have never heard anybody say how it would be affected, how it will affect my credit and how it will be affected if I wanted to repurchase or refi a house within two years and uh, that the money would be due in four months. And I, they, honestly, they honestly don't know. But, you know, the question is, what can you expect from the housing market? People confuse what happened. You know, most of us who are, you know, 35 and below. The only recession that we're drawing parallels to is the 2008 and 2007 because it's the most recent in our mind. That was a housing crash right. that caused a recession. The, a recession and a housing crash are not the same thing. Just because we have high unemployment and COVID-19 caused a little bit of an economic bubble, that does not mean we have a housing crisis like we had in 2008. The housing crisis caused the problem last time. This time, a bug caused the problem. The housing market is honestly completely separate of it. People think they go hand in hand so tightly because of what happened last time. This is a temporary bubble caused by a, a disease, a virus, what have you, that should see a much drastic recoup and bounce back way different than you saw the 10 years it took after 2007. People's houses dropped and then it tick, 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 tick back. I mean, we're expecting a reopening in maybe five months, tick, 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 tick back, you know? so. The opportunity windows here are so much shorter. We're not talking about a long-term recession. I mean, let's hope. <laughs> let's hope it's short-term. And, and I think with our president and the way he stimulates the economy, we can all pretty much expect 
no matter what you think of the administration, I think we all can agree that his number one priority is to get the economy stimulated. Whatever you think about him as a person or anything in his beliefs, nobody can argue that his number one goal is to feed the beast of the economy. Um, so to think we won't bounce back pretty quickly, I think it's wrong. So do whatever you can to get by so you're prepared to take advantage of that strong economy to come. Don't put yourself in a long-term situation to solve a short-term problem. Yeah, I, look, I, I think that um, I was on a, a webinar the other day and um, these were real numbers uh, from National Association of Realtors, which is where we get a lot of our data from. And when we came out of 07, 08, there, there, was, there were a lot of problems there. But people still had jobs, right? And yeah. people were still taking advantage. So in down markets, prices normally will go down, but the buyers are still there, okay? So in an up market, the prices are up. So it, that, that's just what the market does. It's going to go up and down, okay? Um, so you know, just remember that the amount of sales were record numbers coming into 13, 14, and 15. And so we rebounded very quickly from that. And, and like I said, I, it wasn't five years, but I wasn't in the industry in 08, 09, but I was a victim of uh, mortgage fraud and all that that was going on that pretty much tanked everything, right? Uh, short sales were out of, the, out of whack, uh, you know, uh, bankruptcies and uh, short foreclosures. All the big investment banks closing down. It was a nightmare. I mean, yeah. thank, thank, you, thank God you were in the industry. It was not fun. <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, I live in Atlanta at that time and I can tell you every there was every exit there was a billboard on on the interstate right there I-75 and uh, there were there were um, uh, billboards for realtors up so it probably went from about 5,000 realtors down to about a thousand in that one local area this is a big area right covered a lot of a uh, uh, lot of uh, real estate there but those uh, all of those billboards were just blank because that's where the money was coming from. The real estate was that good, and it and yeah. it so um, but yeah, and, and so you know, I think the main thing here we're trying to accomplish is give some information out, um, and also make sure you are reaching out to all of your sources, make sure you're asking questions. No one has gone through this before. I well, ask the right people, ask the right people the right, right questions. Too. Right. You know, I, I, I'm sure you, your father-in-law is a very nice guy, but he doesn't know what forbearance means and he doesn't know what it's going to do because honestly, the industry, not everyone knows what it's going to do. Um, it's something we haven't seen. So the, don't take advice from people who don't have the experience. You know, talk to your bank, talk to your servicer. They're the only ones who can give you specific information. Then once you have that information, consult with the people you care about. But Let's let's this is one of the situations that getting the proper information from the proper people is going to be way more important than talking to your friends and family because they don't know the answers. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like I said, we're learning things on here today that uh, and, and, and we're in the industry. Right. We're talking to all kinds of people. Uh, I've spoken to my bank and my bank ended up giving me a little bit of misconstrued information. But what it was, it wasn't misconstrued or it wasn't misinformation. It was a lack of. So lack of right, right. Yeah, get, I get emails all day, every day, Kirk. That I, it, it stops me in my track, and I read them, and I'm like, oh, I lied to somebody yesterday because I just didn't think that's what was going to happen. And, and the email shows differently. Like, hey, here's what we decided. Here's what Fannie Mae put out, and I'm like, wow, didn't think that was going to happen. So there's new stuff ever changing. It's it's a yeah. really static situation. So unless you're on the pulse all day, every day, you just can't fully understand the scope of it. You know. I had a guy yesterday call me. He wanted to do a jumbo loan, and I started looking at jumbo loans, and it, it, nobody wants jumbo loans right now, you know. And I started thinking to myself, why is that? Why wouldn't they want to write jumbo loans? That's the most qualified buyers. So I called my secondary guy, and I'm like, why is our jumbo pricing so bad right now? But the small pricing is way better. He goes, Jordan. He goes, honestly, the investors. If I do six loans right now at two hundred thousand, maybe one of those guys files for forbearance in the next two months. Maybe one. But if I do a jumbo loan and he files for forbearance, 1.2 million is not getting recouped and we're screwed. So they're not even willing to take the risk on normally the most qualified buyers because the amount that's at risk is too great for their appetite. They would rather, you know, um, basically dis distribute their their risk 
yeah. of, among the bunch of less qualified buyers just because they're scared of the forbearances. So if you don't think these banks are looking at that when they're loaning money right now, like what if I let this guy purchase a house and as soon as he closes, he files for forbearance with us. Now I got a million dollars out on the market that we're not recouping anything on. But yet, trust me, every one of these banks uses a credit line to fund that. Their creditors want the interest on that line. OK, mm -hmm. so if you think as a bank, I'm not paying interest on your loan while you're not paying me, you're wrong. So I got money going out and none coming in. That puts me in a very precarious spot as a lender is how much money do I put out there without reassurance that these people are going to pay me back. So, of course, you're going to see the guidelines shrinking really, really fast because we don't want that exposure as a lender. You know, people have to think about that. Well, my, my lender told me he could do 580 last week because he probably could. And there are some people still willing to do it. But it's not as common now because more people are afraid that those buyers are going to file for forbearance as soon as they buy a house. There's just so many more variables all of a sudden. So the lenders, the box used to be here. It was really wide. It's shrinking very, very fast, you know, and, and a lot of agents and, uh, you know, clients don't realize why the opportunities are shrinking for them, even on the lending side. There's so much that it affects. You file for forbearance when you don't need it. You literally are helping change the lending landscape for other people, right? Because now the banks are more conservative because you're not paying your loan. Like you, it's not just about you and the money you save. Like you literally affected an entire industry to save a buck that you didn't need. It just makes no sense, you know, and it literally... Somebody asked me, they said, hey, you're going to get that PPP loan. And I said, why? I'm busier than I ever been. You know, and they were like, well, it's free. No, it ain't free, man. Nothing's free. <laughs> I weighed the pros and the cons and it's not worth it for me. I, I, it's just not worth it. I let people who need it take it. And the same with the forbearances. Every time somebody doesn't pay, somebody else is not going to get an opportunity, period. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, I think that um, so I, I wanted to know right now like the the rates are i mean just say take a loan that you've done a conventional loan and, and use it are the government loans right now still in full effect or they have they stopped fha's rds usda they haven't been stopped it's just they're more conservative right now because you hate for them to lump you know va fha usda all in a barrel but they have and they're basically assuming that that's a higher risk category right now for forbearance and foreclosure so they are a little bit more stringent. There's still people who are doing the tougher credit scores, but they're not doing them at the rates they used to. I mean, I used to be able to, you know, if you had a if you had a 700 score, your rate was 35, and if you had a 600 score, your rate was 375. It was a quarter hit. It's not a quarter hit anymore. It's 325 <laughs> for the good scores and it's 525 for the bad scores. So, you yeah. know, the places that are still doing them, they're they're doing it at a much, much less risk because they're charging way, way more to offset their risk. It's not it's not an even playing field anymore. Your credit is really creating a wide gap in the approval process and the pricing. Before it was slight hits. Right now, if you're not a perfect borrower, some places still may do it, but you're not getting the pricing you used to. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, again, man, this is this is ever, ever changing uh, uh, deal here because next week we could have the same conversation to be talking about something different. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, FHA could come out this week and guarantee every investor who does FHA loans they're going to cover the forbearances. All of a sudden, now people want to write those, so the right. rates are going to plummet and they'll be better than conventional. We don't know. The reason the FHA, the reason FHA and VA is because the feds haven't come out and let anyone know how they're going to insure those programs, so people are scared. As soon as there's guidance on these programs, you're going to see them loosen right back up because the people servicing them are going to know how the insurance is going to be handled if there is a foreclosure. Whenever they have no assurance what's going to happen to these loans if they default because they don't know there's enough money to cover them, we're just not going to write them. But as soon as they're guaranteed by the feds and by you know HUD what's going to happen on these HUD insured loans, well, hell yeah, we'll write more again. But right now there's a stalemate because there hasn't been any information. As the information develops, the banks start opening back up because they're secure and the risk is less. We just don't know when that's going to happen. We think it's going to happen as the economy warms back up, you know, but we don't know. Right, right. So what's the uh, what's the best rate you you're seeing right now on a? I mean, I've been, I, you know, we try not to just spit them out there, but I've been putting people on thirty years, uh, thirty year terms, uh, locked in a couple in the twos. Um, so thirty years are in the twos. Um, the worst thirty year I've done this week is about three point one two five. The worst. Um, the best fifteen year I've done is two point three seven five. 
So our rates are between 2.375 and 3.2, depending if you have high credit, low credit, cash out, no cash out. Um, but our refinance rates, we haven't really been beat. So that's just for us. I can't say everybody's there. Right. But all of our rates are really, if they're not at 3% or 3.1, they're in the twos for sure. So all my realtor friends out there that are listening in, I'm telling you right now that, you know, you got to listen to this uh, with, with an open uh, mind because what you tell people uh, when they call you and want to know if it's a good time to buy or not, then I can tell you that it's probably better than it's been in some time is in terms of rates. So, you know, your personal situation, they know their personal situation. If you're a very qualified buyer, it's the best time ever. Yeah. If you're a middle ground buyer who needs an FHA loan, a first time home buyer, it may be a little rough right now. But if you're a qualified 700 plus credit score buyer, you're absolutely right, Kurt. There's never been a better time, period. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I, I learned uh, about four weeks ago when people were starting to ask me, and I kept getting the question asked, <laughs> should I sell or should I buy? And I'm like, hey, what position are you in personally? Because you might be in a little bit more different position than you know, uh, my neighbor is, or this guy, or you're, you're one of your family members. You have to do what's right for you. Like Jordan was saying, you know, if you don't need to, to take the PPP or the forbearance or anything like that, like I tell my kids, and I, I've been saying this for years, there is nothing out there that says that there is a free lunch. There is no free lunch, okay? So basically somebody paid for the bread, somebody paid for the macaroni, somebody paid for the sandwich. So when my son says to me, oh, dad, it was free. No, it wasn't, son, why wasn't it? And I make him explain to me why it wasn't free because somebody paid for that. And so somebody's paying for that. You see how they ran out of money, right? <laughs> and that person, that person who paid for it, at least from my experience, the people who buy me lunch, not only did they pay for it, but they usually want something back. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody just takes me to lunch because I'm charming. It's always, exactly. you know, by the end, they're asking me for something. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, um, and, and really, um, I've got some luxury listings that are, that are going to be coming up too. And my, my, you know, I'm not speaking to the masses and I get it, but I want to say this is like, to me, the people who had money before this and who were pretty stable and, and, and pretty strong through this, uh, some had money in the stock market. I get it. But a lot of them, you know, just having their own stash that are liquid, uh, not just assets, still have money right now. So if you are a luxury listing agent, then list the houses because there are still buyers out there. Um, I, I think the one thing that I, I wanted to address too, and I'll be very careful about how I say this, but you know, four years ago, Jordan, we had a downturn and I'm saying four years, but it could have been a little longer, but four years ago, we had a downturn here in Louisiana, strictly in Louisiana, Texas, Arkansas, because of the oil industry, potentially Oklahoma, but Louisiana got hit the hardest. Okay. The reason they got hit the hardest because it was the least diverse. You know, right. Houston got hit like Exxon. Their employees got hurt the same, but there's so many other industries in Houston and in Texas that they were able to spread it out over all the industries. Yeah, right. Louisiana took the brunt of it because we're least diverse in our industries. You're right. Yeah. And so I think that a few things are going to happen here is what I've seen in the last 12, 13 years uh, uh, being here in the Youngsville area, Lafayette, is the fact that, uh, which is heavy, heavy oil right here is a lot of mom and pops were here, okay? And then a lot of mom and pops got bought out and, and you know, the bigger companies had to stay in power in most cases. Now, yeah, there are companies out there laying people off, some of the bigger companies, but they got to stay in power. They're gonna be around, right? Even the price of oil is affecting things, I get it. I know I know people in my family that have lost their jobs and all that, they're, they're gonna come back, I promise you. You've got to stay positive. I'm telling you, I talked to a guy yesterday. They started a business during this that's thriving right now in these times. So what we do best is, is we pivot, right? We stop and we pivot. And when we pivot like that, it forces us to think and we create other businesses. There are inventors out there that are inventing things. There are kids out there that are 17, 18 that are seeing uh, value in building certain things and uh, for these times. And I think that our kids are going to be better for this. They're going to be relentless as time goes on. I have a 13 and a nine year old. They're seeing all of this. My son's sitting there and he, you know, he saw the news a few times here and there and he, he's spitting out information. I'm like, where'd that come from? And he's just like, well, I saw it on the TV just passing by. So um, be careful what you expose your kids to in, in that case. But um, 
So uh, anyway, let's see. Do we have any comments or anything right here? Let's see. Captain, Captain Kirk. That's, that's all they said. Happy Captain Kirk. Can you save me? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, I think that this is a good thing and I appreciate your time because uh, this is important to me. It's I know it's important to you. You've done a lot of things across the country and, and, and sharing and coaching and, and, and so forth. But um, I want to stay on top of this. Um, I want to help my community. And if you're a realtor out there and you're going to watch, you're watching this or you're uh, going to watch a recording at a later time or whatever, you really need to dive in and, and really study the market and look at what kind of trends we're looking at. I look at our MLS more today than I ever have, Jordan, because it's telling me a story about what's closing, what's back on the market, uh, how many reductions in the pricing market, how many new listings. Um, and all of these things are, they're touch and go right now, right? Yeah. So I've seen numbers way up in our closes, and I've seen them like a third down. And it's like, man, that's crazy. And then two days later, it's like, you know, 75 deals closed uh, yesterday, you know? So there's a lot of good things happening. You're busy. You're a realtor. You have refis. So right now, would you say uh, the percentage of your refis versus new loans, what, what would that be right now? Man, honestly, like just because we're so busy with refis, I would say it's probably like 60, 40 refis. But if I took all the refis out, we're so busy. I would still be busy with just the purchases. We have, I have more in my pipeline than we've ever had. And that I that honestly, I'm busier than I really intend to be. It's just one of those things where there's an opportunity to help people. So we work night and day. We've staffed up to do it, but it's not an intent. This is not our goal of busy. We're way busier than we would like to be. Um, but there are purchases going on. We're closing them. I closed one yesterday um, for sure um, on my own personal sale. And the first day it was on the market. We said, let's just list it, even though it's going on, see what happens. It's got four offers. So there's people buying. I was shocked. I was like, four offers the first day is a good price point, a little lower price point. So there's people looking in those ranges. But still, man, you know, if you it it it, it ended up selling for 20k over listing price because four people bid on it the first day and they bid it up. Um, there's buyers out there and there's still a competitive market for sellers and buyers. There's opportunities for everyone right now. Low rates. Um some places there's less buyers, some places there's more buyers, but the market is not going away. It's not 2007 where everyone's sitting on their hands waiting for something to happen. People mm. are still moving and shaking for sure. Yeah. Well, let's recap and then uh, I want to give some closing words and then uh, let uh, Jordan uh, do some, um, uh, some closing words too. Um, so basically today we talked about, uh, let's see if we can put that up. We actually talked about uh, what does forbearance really mean? We talked about it. If you actually go into forbearance for three months, at the end of that 90 days, when you get to the 120th day from the day you took out the forbearance, you're going to owe all four payments. Okay. The You want to know the facts when talking to your bank. You want to know what you're asking them and you want to ask direct questions. If you call them today and you don't do anything for two weeks, you better call them again and get the information again because it's changing daily from the government side. Okay. From the federal side. Um, is this going to affect my credit uh, negatively? Well, Jordan mentioned the fact that you might be a 750 credit score today. You might be a 750 even if you take forbearance, but you're going to have that little asterisk right there that has that little circle F on there. It's going to say forbearance. That's going to take you today. They're saying it's going to take you two years to buy a house or two years to refi. Okay. Again, that could change. We're just saying what it is right now. So, um, that that's the uh, the rundown. So what's next? What what are we expecting from the housing market? And again, we're talking about right now. He's busier with 60, 40, 40 percent is keeping him busier than he was. It's all relative, right? It's all numbers. So if those numbers are, are way up. Then obviously uh, from, from this. Side, and look, you're not the only one I've talked to in the mortgage business. I mean, I, I keep I'm hearing this. So. Um, you know, so again, where does the housing market go from here? And we think that right now, if you're a buyer, get out there and buy the house. You know your situation. If you're a seller, sell your house. Get it listed right now. Because as we come out of this in two weeks from now, uh, you don't want to be behind the eight ball. You want to be in front of that. Yeah, I, I agree, Kurt. And, and you know, overall, I, I think the idea is to stay educated, stay on your toes, and really figure out what's best for you and your family. Don't just take general advice. Don't take free money. Don't just take something that you know you think you're gonna get free. Do what's really right and what you need. If it's right by your family, you know only you're gonna know. But if you're trying to make sound financial decisions, consult somebody. Find out what the truth is. 
you know, and make sure you're getting all the facts before you do something you're going to regret. We're going to get back to life as normal at some point. It may be a new normal that may be affected how we, you know, open doors, maybe affect how we touch light switches, but it's not going to affect how we do business. It's not going to affect, you know, people buying and selling houses. Some things may change, but one thing is not going to change ever in this country, at least while we're alive. And that's people are going to need a place to live and other people are going to get tired of where they live. People are going to buy and sell and they're going to move. And I can tell you right now, I have several people tell me that they're ready to move to the woods. So even if it's people moving to the woods because they hate other people and they want to be out of civilization, people are going to buy and sell no matter what it is. That's never going to change. Jobs are going to transfer. Babies are going to be had. Uh, people are going to hate their neighbors all the same when this is over with and they're going to move. Um, so do what's smart. Be prepared. And, uh, you know, I hope for the best for everyone. I hope no one has to make tough decisions. But if you do make educated, tough decisions. Yeah, absolutely. And in closing, uh, I would say that uh, if you're an investor, um, the best advice I've ever been told was buy when, uh, when prices are low and sell when prices are high. Right now, the prices are being adjusted. Um, the prices that you're seeing that are coming on the market right now are relative to what the market is, the supply and demand, right? So whatever that is, but that could change next month. I've seen it change in two weeks, three weeks. It's like a faucet, uh, turn it on or turn it off. I want, I want to just say this one thing and this, uh, a lot of you know me, but you, uh, and have been around me. And uh, if you don't, I can tell you that uh, mindset is everything. And I mentioned it earlier. I want you to stay positive. I want you to stay strong. We are relentless and we will come out of this strong. This is what the people of the United States and other places around the world, this is what we do best. We're going to come out of this strong. We've got great leadership. Uh, I think on all facets, even at the state level, all the way up through the federal levels. Um, and um, keep your faith. Things are going to turn around. Stay positive. Continue to tell yourself everything's going to be all right. And I promise you that it will. So we'll, we'll continue to do these things right here. Jordan, again, thank you for all your wisdom and all your time. And uh, we hope you Sure. No, absolutely. Anytime you need, you want to talk, man, I'll, I'll jump on here and tell you what I think I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we can do, right? <laughs> yeah, That's what I think today, man. I might think I think something different tomorrow. <laughs> right. Well, let's stay on top of it, guys. And uh, this is Captain Kirk, and that is... Gerard, Gerard, nice to see you guys. Uh, anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly, and I'll try to help you and your family, all right? Thanks, okay. Kirk. Okay, guys. Well, thank you all. Y'all have a wonderful Friday.